We are recording. Fantastic. All right, folks. Well, welcome to uh, welcome. Well, welcome to 2020. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic year, and we've already got a fantastic lineup for you guys starting this year. Um, as you guys know, Darren's going to be our presenter today. Um, we're going to uh, learn some great stuff uh, about uh, vision inviting. So I, I think. This is going to be one of those uh, a great way, like I said, to kind of get the year started and really start thinking about where we're going this year. So just a couple of things we have kind of just to talk to you about um, who we are. Um, we're agile, uh, coaching Agile Journeys. Um, just as a, an idea is we're a group of volunteers. We come together because we have a passion for learning, growing, and helping others. Um, like myself, I've been here for a couple of years, and I got it because I joined a session, and, and I, I know people like, uh, like Heidi and uh, uh, Lori and those, and it, it brought me in because I just love what we're doing here. Um, and our whole goal is committed to really living out our agile journey to the fullest. Um, we know this is a journey, and we're all going through it together. So how can we do to help share it with each other and help bring about new learning? Um, as we're going. And uh, again, we're dedicated to finding focused topics that help guide the development of our agile coaching journeys. Uh, and so that's actually a call to action for everybody here. So if you have a message that you'd like to share, please reach out to us. Um, we're always looking for more speakers uh, in the future. And so that's something where you can help share your story. Uh, you can go as you, you're here today, so you, you know where to go for, for the events. Uh, but if you haven't, go ahead and follow us on Twitter. Uh, we post things there as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's where we post our uh, all our different sessions. Um, and you can see here all of our different uh, uh, ha uh, Twitter handles for the different co-hosts we have. Uh, we got a great group here. Uh, also, we want to thank um, what our sponsor, the uh, Open, uh, uh, Open Leadership Network. Um, and so this is a, a collaboration that we've been working on over the last year with the Open Leadership Network really to bring about that idea of inviting people to transformation. And that's why for us as a, having uh, OLN as a sponsor just makes so much sense. Um, and so for us, just you know, we want to share that with you that their mission really is that purpose of, of open uh, is to bring about open patterns and open space technology into enterprises that are working to achieve agile or digital transformation. So again, that invitation based aspect, and you can go and learn more about this at open leadership net, uh, open leadership network.com. All right. So again, here are the, our, our fabulous co-hosts today. You're going to see many of us on the phone to, uh, on here today. Um, if after the session you have any uh, questions or, or would love to participate, please reach out to one of us. Um, we're volunteers and we're just here to help make this a better experience for everybody and just make this a more exciting journey. Uh, so one thing we do is I mentioned this is a volunteer based program. Uh, we, we do, you know, we have some sponsors like OLN that helps us that helps us with some of our funding. Uh, but we also um, do contribute like our own time and money to help bring this about. So if you really love what we're doing here, and you'd love to support us, we say, um, help us buy us some coffee, we say. Um, any donation helps. It helps us with things like our hosting of our website. It helps us with things like uh, like our uh, MailChimp chip and our Zoom subscriptions, these sorts of things. Um, so every dollar helps, uh, and we appreciate you all for, uh, for helping keeping this thing going. All right, and just as a quick preview, our next session is going to be with uh, Zach, uh, Zach Bonker and he we're going to be talking about that on February 10th. So if you haven't signed up, go to our website, sign up for that. Uh, and that will be our next session we have beyond. I think we have a, 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 a I think it's a lean coffee, don't we, uh, Isaac and Jeff? We have one of those coming up here in a few weeks as well. I think you're correct. Yeah, that's going to be next Monday is the lean coffee. Monday. Good, good. So that's going to be out there as well. All right, so you guys have heard enough of me talking. You, this is not what I'm here for. We're here to hear Darren. So without with further ado, I'm going to pass the ball over to Darren, and we are going to start uh, learning about visioning. Sorry, we were having a conversation in this room. That's one of the dangers of having two people in the same room like this. So <laughs> I think there was a handoff there. I'm not exactly sure. but It is we'll all you, it. buddy. Yeah. Um, so let me share my screen. And hopefully we can keep the video somewhat level. All right, we're trying. Oh wait, there we go. Go back one. 
All right, so um, if you're looking for some contact information, uh, if you, especially if you have questions about uh, the framework, after I go through it, uh, we have the us at invitingvision.org email address for myself and uh, Diana Williams. Uh, I was planning on including a picture in the deck of her, but she didn't give me one. So you'll just have to go out and look at LinkedIn and find her picture. This right here kind of sums up inviting vision, this quote. What we want to do is we want to teach people to yearn versus dictate how to do it. And the reason why that is, people are smart. You know how I know this? I've asked them. They tell me they're smart. Talk to their bosses. Their bosses tell me they're smart. I've not had a boss yet say they hire dumb people. Matter of fact, they get offended if you ask that. So with that premise that people are smart, um, today I want to talk about inviting vision. But I'm going to talk about it in the context of an organizational vision. So we'll talk about, you can use this for other things, such as personal vision for your family, for clubs, things like that. But today we're primarily focused on organizational vision. So how does vision do typically start off an organization? We start off with like vision scrabble, where we go out there, find a bunch of words, buzzwords, or they'll also play the game of buzzword bingo. But anyways, what we do is we start throwing out all these big, hip, cool words, and we add some more hip, cool words, and some more hip, cool words, and some more. And what we think is, is that we have to include all these in our statements. So what I did is I thought, you know, let's just go out and look at some statements. So I did something bland. Originally, I was thinking like, you could do like a wiki speed or something like that, so I got cool stuff. Let's just grab just a regular old business. So I picked the life insurance companies. And I went on the web and I did a little search and said, okay, I, I picked some random words out of my head from visions that I've looked at as statements in the past. And how do they match up? And it's amazing how they start matching up. And if you start reading through this, and the company's name's removed. But this seems a lot like buzzword bingo, right? We start seeing these all match up. Has anybody else, you can raise your hand, I can see some of the videos. Have you seen this before? I see some hands going up, some of that nod, heads nods. Hey, here's a second one. We'll attract and retain the very best people, our employees. Not with that. And this one here had one of the phrases, but it really just looked like laziness. Like they're like, ah, we're too busy. We don't need this vision thing. Okay. So then what they do is they sit there and they go off site, they create the buzzword bingo vision, then they deliver it in front of a town hall. Their employees show their enthusiasm. The elephant in the room, the middle management, the frozen middle, they gave their support. And then I'm marrying to drive the vision. That's what we typically see, right? Yeah, maybe it's okay, I see you on video. Is this the best way to do it? I say, you know, let's look at some of the data. 40% of the millennials are connected to their vision. I think that is, are you connected to a vision and a feeling? Because I've done my own surveys and I asked two questions. What is your organization's vision? Without looking it up, I don't, there's no cheating in this process. And then how do you contribute to the vision? Less than 10%, and that's really a buffered number, it's probably closer to uh, less than 5% of most organizations, um, are able, people are able to answer that question. That's startling to me. How can you sit there and have an organization go towards a vision when nobody knows what it is? So more numbers, people are disengaged in the US, actually the millennial numbers of disengagement is higher than that. Around the world, people are disengaged. So what I think a good vision has to have a certain elements. You know, the, the, we're gonna attract the best people. How about we have some purpose? How about we have some clarity? You know, we need some time span for this. It's not this, we write this vision and we're gonna write it so um, um, obscure that we can use it for the next 30 years. Or it's gotta be a, you know, a big idea. It needs to be big, it needs to be valuable. It needs to get people inspired. You know, like going to the, the, to the moon at the end of the decade. That inspired folks to accomplish something amazing. So I did. I thought, okay, well, you know, um, we'll go down this health insurance vein, and I'll just put the one together really fast. Um, so to provide the death benefit before the funeral so one, one, loved ones can focus on what really matters most in their time of grief. 
You think that's a good vision? What do you think? Show of hands. Yes, no. Thumbs up, thumbs down. We can do that. Okay, let's walk through it. Does it have purpose? Yeah, there's purpose there. Definitely, I could get behind that. I have clarity. Yeah, I mean, I know I could extrapolate from this that the average funeral is probably about three to five days after death. So in a three to five day period that we're delivering the benefit, I know typically most insurance companies are over a month. So yeah, I can, I can figure that out. I know who my audience is for this. So yeah, there's some clarity there. Time, we got the time there. Uh, not the time to implement per se, but that's, you know, and it's a, that's a pretty big idea to drop your latency of the, the benefit that much. That's got to be a big idea. But it's really kind of like this. This is what the vision statements do. If you remember, I don't know, it's probably a decade or so ago, there was a commercial on TV. It was a Kohler commercial where they had this architect. He's walking the, this couple through his facility and showed him all these great big masterpieces that he's done around the world. And he sits at his desk real smugly and says, what can I do for you? And the lady takes out of her purse, this faucet, puts it down on the table and says, build us a home around this. That's kind of what your vision statement's getting you right there. It's kind of like somebody sitting down on a faucet, say, build me a home around this. We don't know where to go. We don't know what the rules are. We don't know how we fit in. We don't know where to go. So shall we play a game? And this is a War Games 1980s movie reference, if you get it. Um, but that's as good as my jokes are getting people. So if you're not laughing at that one, just expect not to laugh most of this. It's okay. So with Inviting Vision, we've created a game board. So this is our game board. This is our game. So let's play. So we start with a why. Why do we start with why? Because Simon Sinek said. That's why we start with why. I mean, that's, that's a good joke, people. I mean, come on. All right. So we start with why. So right there. So we want to find a purposeful vision. And I'm not going to read all these off. Uh, this is going to be a wordy deck. Typically, I don't do wordy decks, but I want this to be able to uh, travel. So then you can look at it later words. So there's a lot of words here. Uh, just focus on me. Um, so uh, purposeful vision. So what we had before was a good focal point for a vision, right? It was a good thing to kind of center us. So we, we, got some, we got some stuff out of that. And it's plain spoken. We didn't embellish it with super words. We didn't all turn into high school English teachers and, and try to throw all this stuff in there, make it really sound formal and elaborate. It's plain spoken. We could all understand that. But it is a great focal point, especially for a mind map. So what we recommend is for the vision, if you're going to do the vision statement, it's not a bad thing to do that, to set that kind of you know, focal point but we need to expand upon it. So don't focus so much on the content. This is stuff I just made up on the fly as I was putting this deck together. But with a mind map, we can start getting into the details. We can start painting a picture. If I was thought about it um, by the time, I would have put drawings on there. So it'd been a really good mind map. So we'd have pictures, we'd have text. We start painting the picture out. It's something that we as a group can get our minds around. We could get some shared understanding off of this. You know, we could also use uh, some personas, maybe internal employees for our external customer. Um, so, but what we're focusing on here is we're focusing on the what. We're not focusing on the how. That's really important. A lot of times when people get into these vision sessions, start doing this, they start automatically limiting themselves because they start thinking of how we're going to implement this. So you have to remove that thought from your head. That's not something you worry about. This is what you need for your vision. This is the big idea. And then what we'll do is we'll take that vision and we'll sit there and create a story out of it. So we'll write a several page stories and I actually recommend um, outsourcing that. Take it to somebody could actually write a ghost writer, something to make it, you know, really have some, you know, um, weight to it. The, you know, the, 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 the writer's touch, so to speak. So people can sit there and read it and have a good idea in their head of where you're wanting to go. Then after you write it, then go back and, and see how that story aligns with your, your mind map and aligns with your focal point. And then through this process here, all of these get an opportunity where you're fine, but this, these are end up becoming your vision, your guide. 
And matter of fact, what we end up using most often is probably more towards the mind map um, because you could use it for visual representations as you work through your vision. So let's go into the watt cycle. So the watt cycle is the, the left hand side of the orange uh, icons there. So let's start with guiding values and principles. So if anybody stop right now, are there any questions or anybody have any places okay. they want to jump in? I don't have any so far on the slider, so. Awesome. Yeah, no that problem. means they're either completely disengaged or I'm doing things well. Um, <laughs> all right, so guiding values and principles. Um, so we thought right here, and, I, and I'll just talk through this. Don't waste your time reading it right now. But I'd actually put a definition around. This is from Seven Effective Habits of Successful People or whatever the, you know, the, the book. I'm trying to remember the name. This is where these come from. So basically, values are things that we value, but they do change over time. Principles are things that don't change. They're immutable. So I stand on my principles. That's why we have this thing. I will not budge. I will not bend. So we need, so that's just to get those definitions out there. So this is a company values. This is from one of the three that I found before. How many of you think this is what you typically see when you look at company values? Look on video here for some, is that what you see? Do you see something like that? Typically I saw a thumbs up, I see a lot of chin scratching. Okay. So a lot of us see this. I've seen this. I've written stuff like this many years ago. But it kind of leaves you guessing, right? It's words. And they'll make us feel good. We'll go to our offsite. We'll do our, our uninspiring vision. We'll slap, you know, give high fives. We'll do these values right here. We'll high five. But this isn't something people do there every day. And if you're, and you know if your, your values are really bad, because they'll turn it into an acronym, because that's the only way people are ever going to remember them. Right. So here's a couple from Netflix. I, I highly encourage you to go out to uh, Netflix's site there, jobs.netflix.com slash culture. Not right now. Pay attention to this right now. Um, but on there, they've done a really good job of defining values. They've done a really good job of defining principles. And when we get into the boundaries, they've done a good job of that as well. So something to look at um, to augment this uh, presentation. So what's nice about this, you see here, they do have those individual words, right? Judgment, courage. But when you sit there and read through these, you see a lot more context. You know, and there's, they have a word, you know, you can actually talk about on one of them that you can fail. Actually, that acknowledges failure's an option in there. Wow, how cool is that? You don't see that very often. So, you know, that you're, you know, make your decisions long-term, not near-term. So what's nice about this is that we're actually putting some definition. We're putting some real examples that people can look at this and they can sit there and extrapolate their behavior. So we start really having a set of norms because, you know, if you sit there and look at it, when they were walking the guys at Enron out the door in cuffs, one of the things they had on their wall right there as they walked by was integrity because it's one of their core values. Doesn't mean they were living them, right? Apparently they didn't understand them. So this is just two of 10 values that they have. Um, but I wanted to bring it out so you have an example. So when we sit there and we work through this on this board, we expand on our, our, our values. On the principles, I will put out here modern agile. So what I like about modern agile, and I don't want to get into the part of the heart of agile versus modern agile versus the manifesto. You know, that's, um, that really bores me. Um, what I like about modern Agile is as soon as I sit there and show somebody in the leadership role, make people awesome, or I show somebody on the team, make people awesome, they're sold. I like this Agile thing because I want to be awesome. You know, I'm safe, I'm awesome, I'm doing all kinds of cool stuff. So, but what's nice about this is this resonates with people, the way that these principles are set up, right? So there's, there's more definition around them versus, and this is something that's easy for people to remember and guide them. Oh, did I go the wrong way? Oh, there we go. All right, so going around this watt cycle, um, boundaries. So boundaries are a neat thing. I, I've done an experiment before, and uh, it's really cool. I, I was particularly one of them. 
where I sat there and I had these, these development teams. And then I took all their management on a team. And we did an exercise. We played a, a game. Well, the teams all created their own set of roles. And they were really restrictive because they were in a risk-adverse culture. Management, well, they have already have authority, so they didn't create these rules. So the management got done so much faster, and the team's like, well, you can't do that. And they're like, well, where's it at in the rules? We can't do that. So it was interesting. It was a great aha moment for the managers because they realized that their people did not operate how they did. So the reason what boundaries are, boundaries are the, the things. It could be HR. It could be budgetary. It could be all kinds of things. But we need to define what the boundaries are for our vision. Because if we don't, they'll create their own and they'll be more restrictive or they won't act. Or in the last case, they'll just get frustrated because they keep running in all these barriers they didn't know. So you look at your, your high Ds from the disc uh, behavior types, those folks will leave your organization over this. So having these in place is what allows people to be empowered, to make these good decisions. Here's a couple examples. You know, this is a real, real company boundary. There could be no OPEX increase in spending. That's not a bad boundary. That's a real world boundary for them. So the fact that they come out and define that boundary, now we start thinking differently. So then we start trying to figure out solutions to get towards this vision. We know we can't increase, or increase our operational cost. Okay. Or we could go to the, the, the Netflix side of it. It says, hey, you know what? Use good judgment. That's our control. Spend the money like it was yours. Just not in Vegas. So we'll just tag and ask right now, what are some typical boundaries you guys see in organizations? What are they? Do you type it in the chat? Type it in the whatever that thing is called, Slido. Is it Slido? Uh, I think it's Slido, but the chat is great too. Thanks put it in the chat. There. Okay. Any boundaries? What do we think? Well, uh, budget is one of them. Budget. Yeah. What else? Location might be another one. Location, absolutely. What's an example boundary? Oh, this one, Mark. Who decides X? Compliance, time and budget, regulations, sign off from different levels, roles and responsibilities. Yeah. So one of the things that to, to watch out for are certain smells on here, right? So when you sit there and have to go through permissions, well, you guys, are, anything with HR has to go through HR permission. Well, you know, maybe the ba a better way the boundary would be to, if we're going to do to try to tackle something from HR, we're going to have a person from HR be on the team that's pushing that area of our vision. Right. So, or, we sit there and educate people to what the laws are around human resources or what's um, around, you know, we may have security, maybe NIST, you know, 853. All right, that's valid. Oh, okay. We need to educate people to what that is. Um, what we don't want is a bunch of gatekeepers. If you have a bunch of gatekeepers, then your empowerment and everything gets flushed. It's really what it boils down to. So, yeah, and the, this, this is one of my favorite books, The Fifth Discipline. Um, but yeah, the, the quote from that book, vision without current reality is pointless. So what we've done between defining the values, the principles, now the boundaries, we've defined the reality of our what, right? We define the, 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 how we can operate in it. All right, let's go down to achievements. So achievements, we specifically did not call them goals um, because they're not participation trophies. And you don't get rewarded for being busy. So most goals and organizations that I've come across are very busy oriented um, and very, um, um, well, they're, they're just generally a lot of times not very as valuable. So these are elements I think that make up a good achievement. And we call them achievement because we're going to achieve these things. These aren't stretch goals. These are things we're going to do. Um, they need to be valuable and meaningful. Right? We need people to get excited about it. Um, we need to be able to define what success is for those. Um, it needs to align to our vision, duh. Um, needs to be measurable, yeah, but it could be a binary. It could be as simple as that. Um, and it needs to be small enough as we can 
and still meet the value. And it's really think of a Goldilocks zone. Um, I'm not going to get into too much on exactly what that looks like now, because that's a whole hour presentation in itself. So let's look at them. So here's, here's an example one. Start project migration process. What do you think? Is that a good achievement? I see a no head shake. When will it be no. done? What's that? Uh, I mean, what's the reason for doing it? When will it be done? So why is starting it an achievement? Yeah, well, if, so that's the funny thing is, is that I've actually seen this as a strategic goal for an entire year was to start a project. Um, yeah, starting it doesn't give us any reward. It's just starting it, you know, but I know I can achieve starting it because all I have to do is hold a meeting and it's started. Oh, we did a kickoff. So I got another one. Create a new service landing page with email subscription. What do we think about that one? Is that good? <laughs> What's that? I would say why. <laughs> yeah, it's the how. Right. And, and it doesn't really say what, what, because it could just be a mock-up. No, I've done it. So on this one here, I would say it depends. If this is tied, we don't know if this is aligned to the vision, what the vision is. But if this aligns to the vision and it's articulated a little bit better for what new service is, then yeah, maybe it could be. Because we do have a scope there. I mean, we get value out of a landing page with email subscription. Hey, we're thinking about building this product. If you're interested in being one of our first people to purchase it, sign up here. And if we get enough feedback, then we actually build it. I get some value out of that. The way that's written, it's it, it's not good from a um, you know, clarity standpoint. Then what about this one here? Move all assets to the cloud. God love that cloud. What do you think? What yes, is so? Oh, go ahead, Mikaela. I'm just thinking, what is O? O is too big, so it's not clear. You're absolutely what right. What is asset for the, for the company? It's not clear, too. Right. So, exactly. So, we, we don't understand where we're going at on that. Um, and from all, if, I, if I'm in a, a million-dollar company, we could probably move all of our assets to the crowd, cloud, no problem. If I'm in a billion-dollar company, it may take several years to that. If I'm in a multi-billion dollar company, you bet you it's going to take a while, right? Those things don't happen fast. It takes time. So those probably end up extending past the scope of our vision. So what do you think are some good achievements for the organization you're either in or working with right now? What's something you guys are doing that you like? Your context. I uh, usually use the smart model. It's not so advanced like you, uh, you explain it here. And uh, I miss the vision connected to that, but it works good if you have to have some success criteria for achievement. Yeah. Uh, the reason I don't specify the smart model is that I've seen a lot of achievements that adhere to smart, so to speak, but they're not really good achievements. All right, let's move on from that. So, and, and I like this quote from Zig Ziglar, a goal properly set is halfway reached. So we've kind of covered that in those last slides, right? We need to understand what we're doing. Here's a pro tip, pro tip time. Um, you can do mind maps for these achievements. Mind maps are awesome stuff. Matter of fact, you can use that vision mind map that we built earlier. Well, part of that stuff's gonna align into these achievements as well. So then you can sit there and reuse some of that as a starting point for your achievement mind maps. So very nice way to do it. And also, if you build them out in mind maps, you can sit there and as things get marked off, you can start doing colorization of your mind maps. So you can sit there and see things progress through. It's pretty cool. All right, enablers. 
So enablers are a fun thing. I like to think of them as in our game as bonuses. So what enablers do are they're designed in such a way that it allows anybody to play in the game. So in this process here, we're really looking for the people that are going to, to, to um, and we'll get to this in a minute, opt in and, and want to drive the vision forward. But you're going to have a lot of people in the organization that are just going to be more compliant. They're not enrolled in this vision, but they are an employee. So we'd like to give them ways to play into the game as well. And what this is, and I'll give you an example, a real world one. So I had a client that sat there and they, they wanted to increase their knowledge. And when we could really switch around to be more of a learning organization. So one of the things they had was the Creative Learning Center to where they could get TED Talks, internal TED Talks, and, and, and those type of things. Um, so what they did is they, they created these uh, enablers and their enablers were um, attend a TED Talk or give a TED Talk, right? I don't have to buy into this whole thing, but I can still go enjoy and watch somebody speaking. And that's still my part, part of the participation. I'm driving the vision forward but I'm doing it from a less committal, committed way. All right, invitation, leadership, and community. So this really applies to our Watt side of it. That's why it's in the, the orange side there. So really the, to, to distill this down is that we want people that are working on this vision, we want to invite them in because when we do that, we are respecting who they are, we're showing them respect, but we're also giving them some authority. We're giving them the ability to say, no, it's okay. They don't have to come in on this, perfectly fine. If they feel their, their, their time is more valuable spent someplace else, we trust you're gonna do the right thing. So that's saying we trust you. Leadership. So leadership here is in a couple different forms. One is leadership's gonna emerge all over the organization. You're gonna have passionate people that wanna drive things forward. We're going to give them the platform to do it. But then we're also going to sit there and encourage our formally authorized leaders to lead by example. So they're going to be in this as well on the same level as everybody else. So, and the quote that I actually used earlier today, you know, I can't hear you because your actions speak too loud. So if you want to be a good leader, go out there and do it. Show everybody, you know, um, by example. And then community. So uh, Peter Block's got a great book on this subject. I recommend it. Um, called community, so it'd be easy to find. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a sense of belonging. So part of the inviting fr vision framework is we want to create that as a community where people feel like they belong, like they are able to have dialogue with the, uh, one another. And the difference between dialogue and discussion is dialogue where we're exchanging ideas, discussion we're jockeying to who's winning in the ideas. So we're looking for dialogue here, the free flow of ideas. Um, and we're also with this where people are going to look to each other on how they act. You know, this is part of that writer and herd thing from the Switch, the Heath Brothers book. So, well, that didn't come out very well. Um, but anyways, so we did the first lap there. The first lap around that, that left side circle or the watt cycle. Um, a lot of times that's done with leadership teams is to work through that initial path. And the reason why we do that is that we want to set some of the path out there. We don't want to go to our organization with a blank slate. Coming to the organization with a blank slate for your vision will give them a lot of anxiety. You know, they're going to feel very uncomfortable with it. So what we're doing is, is we're laying out some of the, oh, I'm getting a phone call. Hey, I wonder who it is. Um, so we're laying out some of the path here. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the invitation. We're gonna do, uh, you know, encourage our leaders to, to um, talk and promote it in the order side of the organization. But we're gonna encourage people to come back into everybody come back and revisit these. So the first pass leadership, we set kind of this base. The second pass we go through that, um, we invite everybody to come in and be a part of this discussion. So what this means is I'm an individual contributor inside my organization, I can have an impact on our values, principles, our vision, our boundaries, our achievements, enablers, I can have an impact on all that. So after this first pass, one thing I don't expect to maybe slightly tweaked is the vision. If you have major changes in vision at this point, you probably don't have the right people in the leadership positions. I can't say it any more clear than that. 
Um, <laughs> if they're way off, then they probably shouldn't be where they're at. So we go through this pass again where everybody gets a chance. And, and, and for group size, get back to slides here. So when you're looking at doing the repeat, if you got a small, if we're looking at this from a small team size, Lean Coffee is a great format to run this in. You can do a lot with Lean Coffee in this. If you got a little bit bigger size, World Cafe is probably a better format. You know, if you look at it bigger, you know, a lot of people, then I find open space is about the, the best way to go there. And that's just my personal belief on that. We don't specify the, how it gets facilitated because, you know, it, it's okay to use different things. It's okay to explore different things. So these are just some of the, these are some of the recommendations we have for just from our experience. Enablement team. So the enablement team is much like the idea from John Cotter's Guiding Coalition, in a way, ish. So what this team focuses on is just helping others, right? So what they do is, and the enablement team needs to be decided before you get into your house cycle um, at a minimum, but you can bring this group in um, even before that, that you know, the, the going through through that gauge. I often, the way I, I recommend to do it is to have like a core group of enablement team. Usually those are your, your people with enough role power. Uh, but then as you go through the process, you see all these emergent leaders in your discussions around the, the achievements and the principles and the values and the boundaries. We see those emergent leaders, grab some of those folks and pull them onto this team. Yeah, but the whole purpose of this team is to help the rest of the teams move forward. So at this point in the proceedings, so after we go through, so we'll, we'll, we'll say this is, a, since this is an organization size, we'll say we had an open space, right? So we had an open space, we explored our values, our principles, our boundaries, our achievements, our enablers, we got all this data and we figured out who's gonna be our, uh, our enablement team. We sent out the proceedings, which that's basically all the information we, we captured from our discussions. Those go out to everybody. Those aren't restricted to just the people that attended. Everybody gets to learn from that. Then we go into our, um, there we go. Yep, send them out. Go to our high cycle now. So in the house cycle, um, and this is where we start doing the work, really driving the vision. Two of the, two of the mindsets that we want people to have is one play. And by that, we're talking about using game mechanics, but we really wanted to differentiate from game mechanics. The problem with game mechanics is, is I've played a lot of sucky games. You know, if you, there's a, there's a great blog post out there. It's written a few years ago. It's like scrum could die a fiery death in hell. Um, that person didn't enjoy the game either. So for us, the reason we put play there is that the game's got to be fun. People need to enjoy it. If you're not enjoying the game, it's not a good game. Also, I know that if people are happy, they perform, their brain performs about a third better. So if they're having fun, they're happy, they'll perform better. And also the other, uh, the mindset we would have people's learn. While we are getting things done, our primary goal is to learn. So we don't call them task per se, or those, what we're doing in the, is experiments. We're doing it to learn in our house cycle. So for example, we'll go back and um, look at the, the learning center, right? So that learning center could be one of the things I have. Well, maybe part of that learning center is I may do an experiment on setting up the infrastructure. You know, I have to have the lighting, I have to have the stage, the sound equipment, whatever, to set that up to, to have our uh, webinar equipment, video. That may be the experiment we do. We may experiment to see, hey, let's set all this stuff up. This will give you some context there. So people go forward with their experiments. And experiments, they have um, a hypothesis, which all experiments should have a hypothesis. Um, so we understand what we think is going to happen. Um, out of that also, a hypothesis, you, you know, have measures around it, if, where it makes sense. Uh, action triggers. So again, this is from the, the uh, switch book actually where this comes from, which talks about defining action triggers. So what this is, is where we define who, um, where we're going to perform the work, um, how, uh, where, when we have structure. 
so we have place and time that we're going to perform this work. A uh, backlog or a checklist. It could be as simple as a checklist. This is the work we're going to do in the experiment, right? So if you're from a scrum side of the world or Kanban, backlog will make more sense to you, right? If you're not, checklist may make more sense. Then one, and by that we mean that you can't be on a bunch of different experiment teams, right? So focus on one. Uh, we've done this, done this enough now that we've found that when people try to spread themselves across multiple, usually all the teams fail. Information radiators. Any questions so far? Um, so I have a couple of questions, but they're from further back, like boundaries and stuff. So I think if you just keep going, we'll just wrap up on the okay. questions at the end. All right, sounds good. Uh, information radiators. So the, so the purpose for the information radiators is that we are, I mean, we're radiating, radiating information. Um, but what we're doing is, is we're building trust and we're giving people an opportunity to help us. So it could be something as simple as that, hey, we have a checklist out there. That's our information being radiated. Or it could be something more elaborate as the, you know, kind of team board I have below where they, you know, do how they're feeling for that day. They have a task board, they burn things down. You see some impediments and, you know, team health and all these other things. Um, it could be something more elaborate like that. Uh, but what it does is everybody that's doing these experiments, everybody has information that they're radiating out. It needs to be where everybody can see it and you know, have a chance to um, interact with it. Feedback loops. So what we have found is that having regular feedback loops inside of these bigger house cycles improves the opportunity to be successful. And by that, what I mean is, is that on a regular cadence, get together with an enablement team, other people that are interested, and talk about where you're at, how things are going, maybe some issues and challenges you're facing. So this gives you an opportunity to get feedback. It also gives you an opportunity to get help. What we have found that when we don't have the feedback loops, um, some of these teams don't get started. And near the end, they try to cram it all in and they, they fell dramatically. Uh, work challenge. So this is one that we had a hard time figuring exactly where it fit, but we think this is probably the best place. So work challenge is a um, interesting concept. Uh, and it's, um, and actually for senior leadership, they get a lot more buy-in on this than you th would think. What, what the work challenge is, is as a, contributor, if I'm working on something that's not aligned to the vision, I could challenge that. I could say, hey, what I'm doing is not what I should be doing. And so I could go to my boss and say, hey boss, you're doing this work. This isn't, I don't get the right answers. I go to his boss and it's perfectly okay. I could go up as high as I want to go. So I feel like I got an answer to why I'm doing it. You know, there's sometimes it may be, hey, we have to keep the lights on. And this is what this is. All right. I can accept that. But at least then as an employee, I know, right? Because a lot of times what I find in organizations that we'll have our vision, but then we end up doing a lot of dark work, a lot of dark work that people don't know about that aren't aligned to the vision. They're aligned to a silo king um, or queen, but they're not aligned to the, the vision where we want to go. And then again, like the proceedings from the what cycle, the proceedings from the how cycle, get sent out to everybody as well so that we can see how everybody's experiments went. You know, what went well with that? What didn't went, go well? And we could talk about it when we go back in our what cycle, which could be an open space. And nesting. So this is kind of, this is um, nesting. I'm not going to go too much because again, this is an entire um, presentation just on this. Uh, but what nesting is, is that with the inviting vision, we can sit there and do our organizational vision. Then areas underneath that vision, we can also do a nested vision. You know, assuming there's a hierarchy that exists. I don't think most organizations will give that up. Uh, but then a team can have their vision, and then you can self have a vision. So, and we're not, it's not, this isn't unique to inviting vision. You see this with the V2 mom from Salesforce, does something similar like this. 
So, but what it is, is it allows us to roll up and roll down. So in very large organizations, this is how you're gonna to have to do it. You're not gonna be able to have one vision that everybody, all 20, 30,000 employees come in and participate in. Got questions? How fast on the time? Oh, good. You're great. You're great. Awesome. Let me bring up, let me bring up the questions then. Um, everybody can do, uh, you can still add questions to Slido uh, there. And so please feel free to do that. But I've got the questions here and we'll just start at the top. We've got four right now. So how do you, do you want to come in like an interviewer? I can, yeah, I can interview the, the questions here. So how do you know what could be too many or not enough boundaries? And, and do you see boundaries change? So how do you assess, oh, way too many boundaries, too few? And then do you see those change in engagement? Um, that is an awesome question. Uh, the honest answer is experience to a degree um, and just working through different exercises on it. Uh, I, I find if you have a lot of boundaries, and again, it's kind of a Goldilocks thing. If there's a lot of them there, then they're probably not letting go of what they need to let go as an organization. But that's okay. We just have those discussions in an open format with everybody. Right. Right. So I find, especially when you'll see it on the first pass through, you may get more boundaries. Mm -hmm. But when they start having discussions about it in open format, boundaries start going away because it's sometimes the leader's willing to articulate things. Mm -hmm. But when they hear the, from their people and they see how their people are acting mm -hmm. and how they're taking charge and how they are being those emergent leaders, yeah. then they're okay to let go. So then and as a coach, I'm going to try to get them to the least amount of boundaries that they feel comfortable with. Right, right. And if awesome. you sit there and look at Netflix, uh, what they have out there, I mean, they're pretty wide open you know, their vacation time they decide and all these other things it's wow. it's wide open so yeah. figure somebody like netflix could do it not anybody could do it <laughs> we can figure this out absolutely um so let's see there's another one on boundaries so would you consider boundaries as as constraints or would you use other synonyms for for boundaries are they always it's reality okay so um so the, and, uh peter Sanji talks about this thing for his um creative tension so you have your vision and then you have reality. And this is tension of trying to take reality to that vision. So what we've created on this side and boundaries is a part of that is really defining what our reality is. So knowing that reality, we can, we can operate, we can move forward. Mm -hmm. We can feel way more empowered. Mm -hmm. I, I'd even take more restrictive boundaries on it because at least I know as soon as you, you put those down there, I'm going to look for every possible way to get around those boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I'm that way, there's a lot of other people like me. Yeah. Do you see value? This is a personal question. I'll just add this in there as follow up to that. Do you see value in, in trying to make sure that the boundaries are explicit and are identified? Because I know sometimes you mentioned even in there, you know, the those leader, the people who really want to move, if they don't know boundaries there until they face plant into it, mm -hmm. right? That could hinder them from wanting to try again. I'm just hitting all these boundaries I can't see. So as part of what you want to do to help make those visible and say, let's call them out explicitly as boundaries. Yes, you want them explicit as boundaries, but also you want to play the game of what's the worst that could happen, hmm. right? So if, if you'll see this, especially in risk averse organizations, they get scared of a lot of things they have no reason to be scared about. So I like to play the game, you know, what's the worst gonna happen? And then, you know, how are you mitigating that today? Mm -hmm. Aren't you tired of 20 levels of approvals? <laughs> Do you think that's fast? <laughs> yeah. How's that working for you? Yeah. I know. Right. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So are there any, and this is, I think this is a loaded question, I'm sure, because you told us there's a lot more content here. Are there any activities or workshops that can be done at each step or stage in this game, this cycle to teach others, especially the C-suite, the best practices? Uh, I don't like the term best practices. Um, I, I would say that um, but it's one thing that we're looking at, uh, we're launching the website here soon. Uh, matter of fact, if you go out there probably tomorrow, we'll have a thing where you can subscribe mm -hmm. to our mailing list. Um, Cause we're working, uh, both myself and Diana work full-time jobs doing transformation. So, um, you know, we, we, we're gonna start putting out content though, on a regular basis. So that, that content will help. Um, I'm hoping this deck will help. So some people are gonna take what I covered today and run with it and they'll do awesome. Um, and then we're going to put some content out online and the people, some people are going to be able to take that and they're going to run with it. It'd be awesome. 
Um, I know we're looking at probably doing a workshop um, right before the conference in Tampa. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, I think on the fourth, awesome. uh, February fourth. Uh, so we'll get if you're interested in that, hit, hit us up. We'll we'll tell you about it, give you the details. Um, but then what we're going to do there is we'll give a next level down. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we're also looking at doing workshops of how to do the workshop. So each one of these steps walk you through the different ways to do it. So it's not nice. like this is the best way. We'll give you alternate ways to do it. And we're creating canvases and mm -hmm. all kinds of artifacts to make that easier for folks. Mm -hmm. So our eventual goals, we're, we're looking at maybe doing like a, a game itself where you could pull out the box and start working through it. Mm -hmm. So this is an interesting one. How do you trigger this framework when the actors of the value chain are spread out maybe in two legal entities, right? So IT is separated from business and leaders maybe don't trust each other. So when you have separation, you don't have it where you can get everyone together. How do you how do you span that gap? Um, counseling, um, therapy, um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, what I would do in that case is I would look at keeping those individual areas. Let's start their own. Let's work with what we can work with. So I could sit there and run an inviting vision in IT, I could run an inviting vision in the business, and it's not ideal, but I at least start getting their minds to open and going down a path. Because I guarantee you, after you do that and people start seeing that and having that exposure, it doesn't take long for them to have that logical conclusion of, hey, wouldn't it be better if we brought in some of these other folks? And that's the way I would do it as a coach, too, is I would say, I've done this before, actually, where I've had IT, but then, you know, maybe start out the first time with IT because it's such a risk adverse environment. And then the next time we get together for an open space, We'll invite in some of the leaders from these other departments. And then next thing you know, the next time you have it, these people are showing up and then you invite some of these other leaders in. Um, then you have the next one you have, you just have people show up and you don't know who they are. I mean, you didn't invite them. They just, they heard about it and they're coming in, they're, they're party crashing. Yeah. So it'll expand out naturally by that. Mm -hmm. but, but work with what you have. If you could only have uh, maybe your department, you're, you know, you're working at that level and that's all you get this at, then run it at that level. Right. Yeah. Because one thing that helps push things out better than anything else is success. Mm -hmm. And then people doing the storytelling about it, how much they love it, they feel empowered, they're doing all these great things. Yeah. They will sell it to your organization. You know, the worst thing that you think as a coach that you have to do is you have to sell it. You don't. Mm -hmm. They will sell it. You can't sell it. Mm -hmm. You could just maybe convince them enough to get started. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so we have two more. So can you explain how to invite people to give feedback to the enablement team? So you said you wanted that feedback cycle. Mm -hmm. Is that something like a lean coffee, a sprint review, presentation format? What, what does that kind of look like and how they give feedback? Um, it can be all that. Okay. Um, and I don't define it. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of that is it really depends on who you're working with. I think that's best between the team and the enablement team. Mm -hmm. The team doing experiment, the team doing the enablement. Mm -hmm. Let them figure it out. I hope it's not standardized. Nothing <laughs> sucks more than standardization. So, um, yeah, no, I, I think it optimize it for what? Because I mean, if I have a, a team that say, if I have a team that's doing Scrum or they want to run their experiment using, uh, using Scrum, hey, that's awesome, mm -hmm. right? They can use sprint reviews as natural artifact. Yeah. A lot of folks in this, what I found, even in IT, they don't run this as a Scrum team, mm -hmm. right? Interesting. So this may be just a meeting yeah. where they sit there and give some presentation then answer some questions or do a presentation then go into a lean coffee mm -hmm. to expand upon it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Okay. And then last question here, why is it important to understand the what before the how? Um, so this came in from our, from our zoom chat. So can you maybe okay. talk a touch to that? Yeah. So the problem of it is if I start thinking of the how to begin with, I immediately start limiting myself. I, I, I want to think of big ideas, not what is practical for me to implement because I'm going to put buffers on it because I know I'm going to have all this other crap. And the next thing you know, what this big idea is, I water it down to something very lukewarm. Um, and we've been able to get away with that in organizations for a long time now. Uh, the good news is, is we have the great disruptions on its way mm. and all these dinosaurs will go extinct. Um, they'll take their, the, the, the younger, more vibrant companies will take their data and move on. Mm -hmm. Awesome. 
Well, listen, that's great. And I've, I've been watching the chat during this, during this presentation. There have been several people who have been saying this is great content, spot on, and they're really thankful for it. So um, just to wrap up, this is awesome that I actually get to be in the same place um, with, with Darren here. And just to extend a personal thank you for sharing this content with us. And are there any kind of last minute thoughts before I have a couple wrap up ideas, but any last minute thoughts for us? Uh, yeah, if you uh, reach out uh, to me, if you want a copy of the deck, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll make sure you get it. And also, or we'll have it. Uh, mm -hmm. send out through this group you know, those are signed up uh, but also i'm going to send out a um a survey and what that is is really what can we do what can we build what can we you know get out there to make this easier for people to understand and get to it quicker because uh, we have a lot of ideas i mean we're, we, we've even talked about putting a a book together where it's a fable when you actually walk through a fictitious company which will be built on a lot of real examples <laughs> Um, but, you know, a fictitious company didn't see it, right? I mean, those, those books are out there. Uh, we've talked about making a board game type of setup to where you can actually play the game of inviting vision. Uh, but those, those things are probably down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, we're really looking for like near term and now. What are things you find would be helpful? Awesome. That's great. Well, listen, if you liked what you saw today and you say, man, I just want more of Darren, I'm going to throw out there. We've got um, coming up here at our Coaching Agile Journeys. You can go to our website, coachingagilejourneys.com. You can see our upcoming events that we're going to have. You also, there's a link there for previous events. We'll have the recording and the deck as well available there so you can get to it from here. But there's a clicker there. I want to show you the Open Leadership. We're partners with the Open Leadership Network, and we just want to uh, encourage you. They have a symposium coming up in Tampa, Florida, and Darren's going to be a part of that. So if you say, man, I just need more Darren in my life in the next month, uh, go check out Open Leadership Symposium. Um, it's going to be great. You need, you need more Darren. It's like cowbell. You can't get enough. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so we want to encourage you to check that out. And uh, also, if you're a subscriber to our newsletter, um, we just recently sent out a survey for 2020, and uh, we'd really appreciate your feedback so we can get more great content, more speakers like Darren um, in the future. But I do want to thank everybody for joining us today from wherever you are, and I have the rare privilege of shaking your hand and saying, Darren, thank you so much for being a speaker here on Coaching Agile Journeys. This has been a pleasure. It really has. Thank, thank you for having me. You. Yep. All right. Well, everyone else, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you guys all next time. We have Lean Coffee next Monday. So you can join us for that. It's every second, mo uh, second Monday of each month. So uh, hopefully we'll see some of you guys there. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day, everyone. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.